love to bring you on the journey into the book of Jonah, the miserable man of God. Um, and I, and I, I really hope that you can take the time to really follow us. So here it is. Let's go. So I'll start with saying this. I'm sorry to say that I'm a, a glass half empty kind of guy. Maybe it's me or maybe it's the British in me. Life is hard and I don't always tend to see the positive in things immediately. We, the British, we approach life in the key of sarcasm. So let's just take an example. If it was sunny outside, we'd say, oh, look, it's raining cats and dogs out there. If, if it was raining outside, we would say, lovely day. Our, the way that we construct our lives is, is kind of behind a barrier that helps us not really truly express what we, what we feel. Um, I'm not even a morning person. <laughs> it takes me a solid three hours to try and wake up and to accept to an acceptable state of mind um, where I can have a conversation with people without wanting to throw a chair in their face. Pray for me. I am working through these struggles. I'm trying to get there. Um, I'm trying to change. Miserable, maybe, is the word you could describe me. Maybe. It's, it's a word, but I have to be honest and say I do have my limits. I do. I'm not perpetually miserable. When it comes to my faith in God, when it comes to the belief that he is faithful and loving and, and a great God to me, when I think about all the blessings that he has lavishly poured upon my life, I am less than miserable, to say the least. He has been so good to me. And I propose he's been so good to you. One thing that makes me so joyful about God is his graciousness and his love to others. This week, I'm thrilled to announce the progress of baby Charlotte. For the benefit of those who aren't part of our community here at Eastside SDA Fellowship, here in Kirkland, we've been praying for a young baby who's been waiting for a liver transplant. And this week, to God be the glory, she received her liver. And the operation has taken place. She's now recovering and we're continuing to pray that all will be well as she adjusts. It's been a crazy number of months waiting and we are glad that God has been gracious to baby Charlotte. Being grateful, being grateful for God's goodness to others is something that we would expect of everyone. Today, however, we begin a maiden voyage into a new series discovering the miserable man of God. Jonah, so miserable that he couldn't even be happy for the grace that God gave to others. Over the next five or six weeks, I haven't quite decided how many yet, I'm inviting you to join us as we go deeper to uncover the biblical book of Jonah. So, without further ado, let's begin the miserable man of God. Pray with me. Father, we are so grateful that you give us the opportunity to connect through technology. This morning, as we dive into your word, reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I would say that Jonah is a very well-known story, infamous in fact, not necessarily because some people think it has a happy ending to a difficult story. You remember the story of Jonah. You know it well because of one little, well, big detail. Um, it's the reason why Jonah has been picked as the perfect children's story. Um, this particular detail is the thing. You know it, right? The thing. The one thing that makes you remember the story of Jonah. That's right, it's the fish. It's the fish. It's always been the fish. We all remember that big fish that came up and swallowed Jonah and, and different depictions of that fish has been made all over in different ways in shapes and forms. Some of those fishes are scary. Some of those fishes are not so scary. But it's the one thing that we remember Jonah for, the fish. In fact, some of us, I dare to say, it's the only thing that we remember the story of Jonah for. Out of four chapters 
and 48 verses, we remember one verse that punctuates the entire story. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. This one tiny verse, guys, it's amazing how we latch on to one thing and make it the thing. But this story, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is not about a fish it is not out of all the 48 verses that this book offers what is this story about jonah chapter 1 and verse 1 let's go now the word of the lord came to jonah son of amittai saying whoa stop 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 <laughs> let's before we go any further this is so rich we've got to hold on to this what's What's going on here? Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Okay, a couple of things. Please, 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 if you have your Bibles, please follow with me. Turn your Bibles, uh, turn on your phones to the book of Jonah and, and look it up for yourself. It says, now the word of the Lord. Look at the words in Jonah chapter one. Do you see the word Lord? Do you see that it's capitalized all the way through? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Lord, it's capitalized. Whenever you see Lord capitalized in the Bible, we're talking about the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh. You've heard it before, Yahweh. Actually, the ancient Jews didn't even have vowels. The original spelling for what they represented uh, was actually just four consonants. So Yahweh, you know it's spelled Y-A-H-E-H. -H. Imagine taking out all the vowels and it would just be Y-H-W-H. -H. It was the most sacred name to describe God that the Jewish nation wanted to protect that name. They didn't want anyone else to try and, and pronounce it. And so hence, this was the, the representation for the name of God so that no one would make a, make a mockery of him. And the Hebrews wanted to protect that very name of God. And so it was only much later that the vowels came in and, and now we have this pronunciation, Yahweh, make an attempt to house the name of God in language why is this important well they didn't mess around they took seriously the name of god this book opens with a legendary departure of word that comes from yahweh now the word of the lord came to jonah son of amittai we all wait for word whether word is good word or whether word is bad word word changes the way we think and it impacts how we behave the moment we're currently glued to our screens yearning to hear about word word of covid 19 as it takes over the whole world word can travel thousands of miles in seconds just like this because of the technology in place. All it takes is for someone to buy, panic buy toilet roll. That's all it takes. And word travels the world in seconds. Bad word can make us nervous and causes us to fear and to shudder. Do you know what? I haven't actually worked it out. What's worse, waiting for bad word to come or receiving word? of bad news word coming can also be a good thing it can have the power to change morale and allow joy to enter the room good word brings relief and strength to the weary like those eons ago in the genesis of time as we know it the first account tells us that he hovered over the face of the waters and spoke good word the very first word ever spoken pierced through the darkness and flooded light into the void let there be light the bible says the word of yahweh came to jonah son of amittai i want you to feel the intensity of what god has given to jonah son of amittai so a few things just to help color the picture and help us understand a little bit more about what's actually being said here jonah's name the hebrew uh, meaning for Jonah actually means dove. That's right. Flappy, flappy, cute, white, little dove. Why is this so significant? When's the last time that we heard of a dove in the Old Testament um, that, we've, that we've heard of something significant about a dove? That's right. Genesis. Genesis. 
specifically Genesis 8 and verse 11. Remember Noah and the ark? That's right. And remember that they ended up stopping and waiting for the water to subside. Do you remember Noah sent out a couple of birds to try and find out if the water has subsided? Yes, the final bird, the dove, was sent out. It was released to find out if there was land. The dove served as, get this, a messenger. Yep, the dove served as a messenger and the dove came back to the ark with a, ark with a freshly plucked olive leaf. That gave Noah evidence that the waters had survived and that they were safe. What did the messenger, dove, bring back to Noah? Well, I'd like to suggest today that the dove brought back word. Not just any kind of word, good word. Really? Now someone calls me in the middle of a live stream? I need to work out how to just stop that. The dove brought that word, good word. So check this, check this, follow me, follow me. Jonah, Jonah, the dove, the son of Amittai, the, 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 the messenger, the one who brings good word is now setting up the scene of the story. The son of Amittai, Amittai, his father known um, um, in the Old Testament and his name Amittai means faithful. Are you, are you following me? Stick with me. Here we go. We have it. Dove, the son of faithful, the messenger. The word of Yahweh came to a messenger who comes from a family known for their faithfulness to carry good word to Nineveh. Tell me you caught that. This is why I started in saying that this writer in the book of Jonah is, Jonah is trying to be hilarious. This is a satirical writing. He wants us to try and dive in to all the idiomatic sayings. And he, he wants to bring us in through his poetic language. He plays on all of these names and he accentuates all these names because Jonah, the dove, the messenger who comes from a family who's known for their faithfulness, son of Amittai, known for their faithfulness to carry good word to Nineveh. In, in, in essence, Jonah is called to carry good news to the Ninevites. I struggle to find agreeable meanings for Nineveh. I think some scholars are arguing about this left, right and center. But I did find something that was kind of remotely interesting. Um, I haven't quite come to conclusions yet, but I'll share it with you. Um, so when you write Nineveh in the cuneiform, cuneiform is an ancient system of writing like hieroglyphics. You've probably um, heard of that before. That's a version with shapes and symbols and signs. Cuneiform script, when you write Nineveh in that, it's actually a fish inside a house. I know, right? Really interesting. A fish inside a house. And that's the meaning of Nineveh. The great fish that swallowed Jonah became a messenger carrying the messenger who carried good word from a family who were known to be faithful to Nineveh, the house of the fish. I hope you're following with me with these really interesting phrases that the writer is playing and toying with. I don't have backing for this. I don't have support for me. Please don't quote me on this. But I suspect that the fish was known to the Ninevites as if it was like a, a signature to, to the nation. Well, it was in their name, so it has to be in, in my perspective. But please don't quote me. It's like the, the Loch Ness Monster is, is akin to Scotland or, or bears and cougars are akin to Seattle. Uh, so what does Jonah do after receiving clear instructions from Yahweh? Does he travel to Nineveh? to be the bearer of such good word? Let's find out, Jonah chapter one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, the dove, son of Faithful, to bring good news to that great city and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. It might sound like this is harsh, yes, because their wickedness has come up against God, but remember what's What's, what's Jonah supposed to do? He's supposed to bring good news. So it doesn't matter about their wickedness because Jonah has good news for them. And then it, the Bible says, but Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to, uh, sorry, 
he went, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare, went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So he goes down to Joppa, which is not far from where he is to catch a boat. Check this. Joppa. What do you think it means? Joppa means beautiful. That's right. Thing of beauty. It's no strange thing that when we try to travel in the opposite direction to where God is taking us, we choose to depart from a port that is completely the opposite place to where he wants us to go. Where God wants to take us isn't necessarily a thing of beauty like we know it. Being committed to the evangelistic call of redeeming Nineveh is not sexy to the onlookers. It's not something that we want to write home about. Joppa, on the other hand, is brimming with appeal. And so Jonah, the messenger dove, with the good word, rather than being obedient, chooses to follow his feelings and not his God. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you know what that is like. Like Jonah, we're willing to pay the cost of boarding a ship at Port Beautiful, Port Comfortable, Port this makes sense. Port, I don't want to get myself into any trouble. Port, simple. Port, uncomplicated. Port, not scary. Headed for Tarshish. Tarshish, what does that mean? Literally translated, the sea coast. Actually, Tarshish is more of an idiomatic statement in the Old Testament. Tarshish, the sea coast, idiomatically known as the Timbuktu of the then known world when we um, when we use the word timbuktu what we're trying to express and declare is that this place is so far away it is like walking to the ends of the earth that's timbuktu the tarshish the sea coast of the known world in other words jonah specifically chose to go as far as he possibly could go Oh, shucks. I think I've lost my place on here. Let me try and find this. Uh, got it here. Bear with me a second. Right. Got it. Jonah, the dove, the messenger of Yahweh, the bringer of good word, boards a ship at Beautiful and finds himself at Tarshish. I want to show you guys something that's so interesting. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. Okay. Check this out. So, if you can see... Are we good? Yeah. Okay, if you can see from this map, okay, um, here is where Jonah is. Not far from Jerusalem, he grew up in a town called Gath Hepha. And in this town over here, God asked him to go 600 miles over here to Nineveh. Nineveh is in Mosul, Iraq, northern Iraq as we know today. All right, and so he's asked to travel 600 miles across there all the way there but then jonah picks up himself he goes down to the port of joppa which is not far from 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 gath hepha and he travels 2500 miles across to the tip of southern spain gibraltar that's the kind of distance we are talking about of what jonah does he clean books it to tarshish because he does not want to follow god i need to put it in perspective for you imagine those of you who live in Seattle in the area, imagine you were to walk from here all the way to Orlando, Florida. 2,500 miles. That's the kind of journey that Jonah is willing to take to avoid the call of God. 2,500 miles west of home so that he does, and, and so that, don't miss this, God's plan for Jonah's life becomes, here we go, inconvenient inaccessible and near enough impossible have you booked it to Tarshish before have you found yourself in the completely other side or have you placed yourself in the circumstance well sorry lord i can't do what you've asked me to do guilty as charged i'm driving around seattle and there are moments where i Let's just say, don't do what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> but maybe you've been there before. You're coming up to a traffic light. You want to make the turn and the light is green 
and you know that the light is going to change. There's a car that is about to turn. And so what you do, you drive up really, really close to their bumper and you kind of hug their bumper so that even if the light changes, you're going to go through regardless. You don't care if the light turns to red, you're still going to make it because, oh, well, I guess I'm in the middle of the junction now. I might as well just turn because it would be too safe for me to stop in the, uh, unsafe for me to stop in the middle of the junction, right? We've all done it before. We've all had those moments where we, we, we place ourselves in those circumstances where we know what we're supposed to do, but we turn around and we're just like, ah, oh, well, you know what? I'm in the junction now, Lord. And this is exactly what Jonah is doing. Jonah is literally in the middle of the sea on this boat. And he's like, oh, well, here's where I am. I can't go to Tarshish now. I can't go to Nineveh now because we're on the way to Tarshish and we're traveling so far. Lord, you might as well find someone else to do this because I'm not the one who can do this. I'm too far from your will, Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of of Amittai, Dove, son of Faithful, to bring good news to Nineveh. This is the hilarious thing about this entire story. There is nothing congruent in this narrative so far other than the word of Yahweh. Jonah is just not making sense completely. He is a prophet, a man of God. We would expect better from a man of God, this prophet. And yet Jonah the dove, on the other hand, ends up delivering good news. Eventually, later on, we find out to Nineveh. But, but let's just understand something. Even though he delivers that good news, he doesn't even want to. He doesn't even want to. Imagine the messenger fish has to vomit the messenger with good news to the city that is home to a fish. Stick with me. I'm going somewhere. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. This is rich. Don't miss this. This ancient phrase is common and loaded. We've seen this before in the Bible. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of Yahweh came to Amos, came to Zephaniah. The word of the Lord came to Haggai. The word of Yahweh came to Zechariah. If you just flip your page in your Bible, just one leaf, you'll find the book of Micah. And it starts the word of the Lord, Yahweh, that came to Micah. This phrase is pregnant and leaves the reader expectant. All the prophets before who came with the word of the Lord came to declare and proclaim and to preach and to demonstrate. All the other books have chapter upon chapter detailing that the word of the Lord came. Reams and reams of scroll where the prophet is simply just a postman. Well, actually, in America, you call it mailman, right? <laughs> mailman. Yes, that's right. The books where these prophets exist and serve only as a medium to detail that a word, good or bad, was written. A mailman was employed and the delivery was carried out. But the most important part of these stories is not the mailman. Nope. It's the word itself. It's the message, a message of judgment, of salvation, a message of damnation of, or, or redemption. Maybe you've heard it before. The message is the medium or content is king. But Jonah, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is completely and utterly different. What's the message of Jonah? What does he have to declare? Actually, the message he brings from Yahweh is just five Hebrew words out of the whole chapter in the word of Yahweh that Jonah actually physically delivers, the message that he gives to Nineveh is just five Hebrew words. Jonah chapter three, verse, verse, um, verse four. 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's his sermon, folks. Okay, it's not five words. It's eight words in English, but it's five words in Hebrew. Hebrew. His five word sermon is the, is the only thing that he declares as the actual word of Yahweh. In, other, in all the other books, the prophets speak incessantly. But Jonah's message to the people 
that God chose to speak are captured in a five word sermon. That's it. Oh, how I wish I could preach a five word or eight word because I speak English sermon as skillfully as Jonah. Imagine you turned up to hear me speak today an eight word sermon. This preacher offers you just eight words and it transformed your life. Oh, hey, dude, how was the sermon? Oh, those were the best eight words I've ever heard in my life. Folks, 48 verses, four chapters. This book is not about a fish. This book is not even about the word of Yahweh. It's not even about that. This entire book stands alone in comparison to all the prophets in the Bible. This book is ultimately about the miserable man of God. Jonah, Dove, son of Amittai. How many times have we made our most labored evangelistic efforts so much about communicating the message of God? This thing, the words, when God also wants to communicate to the rest of humanity, the actual man or woman that is carrying the message. Don't miss this. God uses humanity to change humanity. The word of Yahweh is not black ink on white pages. The word became flesh and dwelt among men and women. The word is living and his name is Jesus. Communicating word. The word is communicating an actual personhood. If this model is true, then surely God would want to communicate the Sams and the Kings, the Marvins and the Jennies, the Abbeys and the Tiffany's, the Marks and the Jodies as the actual message that can transform the face of humanity. The book of Jonah is satirical. It's a story of a man who has pure issues. We read it and can't help but laugh at its irony and juxtapositions. Don't tell me that you haven't looked at this story, looked at Jonah the Mona and wondered, how could you be so stupid? The man of God who is supposed to be the light of the known world, the one who brings good news, runs as far as he possibly can to avoid saving over 100,000 people from the judgment of God raining down. What an imbecile. Who does that? Who runs away from God like that? Who lives like that? Jonah is not the example as to how we should evangelize. (laughs) What an idiot. Oh, shucks. And then I realize maybe this story is less about the historical Jonah. And maybe this story is more about the current me. Charles Spurgeon says, Preach the gospel. Use words. Use words if necessary. Today, I want to encourage all of you who are listening today to recognize that God wants to use you to be the message of hope to everyone around us. Maybe you feel you haven't got the confidence to wax lyrically with scripture. But today, that's not what I encourage you to do. Today, I ask you to be amazing kingdom representatives of Jesus Christ. Not in word, but in action. If we learn anything about this miserable man of God, we learn how not to be the light and salt of this world. Thank you.